Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all attendees. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Biofilm and Filament Analysis and Kiss and Run, Imaris XT. This is the second lecture in the short of the beaten track in image analysis webinar series. I'm Anna of Bitplane, and I will be the moderator for today's event. I would like to warmly work, welcome both the members of IMARIS user group community and the researchers who are not yet using our software in their everyday work. For those of us who have not heard of us before, I will start with a short presentation of IMARIS and then explain to all of you the off the beaten track in image analysis webinar concept. IMARIS is the complex software uh, which has been on the cutting edge of 3D and 4D image analysis for 24 years. And we are providing researchers with ready-to-use solutions for their mic microscopy data sets analysis. IMARIS is, uh, consists of three major parts. One of them is IMARIS Arena, which integrates an experiment management, batch processing, and result integration into one platform. Then it comes the surface view, which includes all the IMARIS analytical features, uh, where, which includes automated and semi-manual segmentation and creating data models in 3D or 3D plus time. It also consists of filament tracer, which lets you trace uh, filaments and neurons in 3D space. Tracking models with the newly developed lineage editing tool for tracking, dividing, and fusing objects and creating uh, trees, lineage trees. And Vantage, which is the advanced analytical module where users can further explore relationships found in the data by creating interactive plots with user-defined axes and uh, it's possible to compare experimental groups or looking for outliers. But Along the way, we realized that even providing such an advanced platform, uh, the future of imaging calls for task-oriented models developed by application scientists. Some years ago, we created IMARIS XT, which facilitates the communication between biologists and computer scientists by providing interfaces known to both parties. Visual data exploration interface inside IMARIS and the bridge to connect to MATLAB, Python, or Java to manipulate with the dataset. Further, we started IMARIS XT developer program, where we invite researchers who like to get off the beaten track with their image analysis approach and can expand the analytical power of IMARIS with custom written code. In the off the beaten track webinar series, we want to present their achievements, which might be of interest for other researchers. We'll host two webinars in the series with different topics. The first webinar, EM and brain wool segmentation and mitosis dynamics, already happened one week before. And today, we are having the webinar Biofilm and Filament Analysis and Kiss and Run application. You can find out more about both webinars and find, out the, find the recordings later on the website, bitplane.com slash xtwebinars. I would like to briefly mention the topics of the previous webinar, where we hosted three speakers uh, presenting the segmentation and visualization tool for light and electron microscopy data sets, a presentation about first steps towards using IMARIS in quantitative brain ball image analysis, and uh, analysis of dynamical parameters of growing microtubules during mitosis. Today, this webinar, today's webinar is very special because the speaker is in the same time XC developer and the member of Bitplane team, a uh, very known member to, all, to many users, so a technical support person from uh, US. Uh, so today, today's speaker is Matthew Gastinger who presents you his own extension for very, very different applications, including kiss and run analysis uh, with surface contact area and surface uh, co-localization. 
biofilm analysis extension and uh, his own filament analysis, including for many different analytical and new approaches for filaments and neurons. So let me hand over to Matthew and let's begin this presentation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, hello, everyone. Um, uh, thank you, Anna, uh, for the kind introduction. I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you. Um, so my name is Matthew Gastinger. As Anna pointed out, I am part of the Diplane support team. Um, and during my time here, many of you already know me, and I just want to thank everyone that I've talked with uh, my users and uh, the users around the world. Just thank you for listening to the talk. Uh, as part of the, the Bitplane support team, um, we don't just identify bugs or um, fix technical issues. Uh, we're all scientists, and we all want to do the best science possible. Uh, and part of that is the image analysis, and we strive to provide the best tool for that image analysis. Uh, and take kind of simple uh, analysis and images that you require uh, to the next level. And I have worked with you, many of our support teams uh, and the sales teams have worked with many of you to kind of developing kind of unique applications using the Amaris uh, software, the, the built-in applications within Amaris uh, to achieve these goals. Um, but a lot of times we have to kind of look outside the box and we've got to try to figure out ways uh, to do some analyses that aren't uh, kind of written in the code within the MR software to kind of use it in a, in a unique and different way to kind of uh, answer the questions that uh, you're asking of your data and, and to, to find out exactly what, what is going on. Um, um, so today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be revisiting a module that is kind of an underutilized tool uh, for many of you. Uh, some of you already have. Some of you may have been interested in looking at it or don't really actually know exactly what this tool is. And it, that is the Mars XT. Uh, many times it's kind of just sitting there. You don't know what, what the potential is of this particular module. My goal today is to highlight some of the power of uh, using extension and using kind of custom coding uh, for a wide set of custom extensions that I have personally developed outside of my, uh, my normal bit plain role. And so one of the things I want to get from this is, is what I want you to take home from this is what can you gain from using these extensions. Now again, these are kind of broad ranged extensions, but what I want you to think about uh, when I'm presenting these tools, uh, there's no real specific science behind the, the presentation today. Uh, obviously all these images are real data that were uh, provided from customers uh, and people that I've worked with over the years and stuff. And, the real data behind this thing, but the, the concept of today is to kind of show you what you can do with the extensions. And maybe you can think in your own sense of your own data and say, oh, I can use that for this particular extension. Or maybe if I modify it, or I can use it for this particular, uh, answering this particular question. So I want to kind of have you kind of think outside of the standard application. Just think about what, what the process and what the extension is actually doing, and can it be used or modified uh, in a different way for your particular uh, need. Uh, or can I make it better? Like all of these extensions, they're custom, they're all modifiable, and it's kind of an un, unlimited way we can modify these extensions. Next, I'm going to talk about real briefly about how to set up the custom extensions uh, within the software so that you know how to do that. We do that within uh, the Amaris Open that Anna uh, spoke about as well, and you can get that information there, but I want to briefly show about that. But in general, the applications that I've created over the past several years um, are uh, utilizing a specific tool uh, for uh, targeting a specific, answering a specific question um, that researchers have come to me personally with or uh, I've seen a, a, a need to an answer this question uh, within the science community. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is a, a kiss and run or a, a touch and go type of analysis looking at the surface-to-surface the -surface interactions over a time or even in a, in a single time point. I'm going to talk a little bit about a surface co-localization tool uh, will we'll, uh, measure surface-to-surface -surface contact area and a surface-to-surface co-localization, a kind of an overlap or a co-localization of two uh, different surfaces. Uh, and a more targeted type of extensions, and this came from a bunch of conversations with customers and with the sales team uh, where we uh, were lacking in a need to be able to kind of analyze this type of data. People have come to this data, shown us this type of data in the support role, and we're, we try to uh, figure out ways to do that uh, to answer these questions. And one of them was uh, an analyzing biofilm data uh, to a certain degree. Uh, there, there's a bunch of free softwares out there that is very commonly used uh, within the community. This kind of uh, builds on a very similar 
concept, but it gives a little different type of result. But in general, it gives you the same type of output, measuring the thickness uh, of the biofilm over time and so forth. I'll give you some other statistics that are uh, available now within the software using this particular extension. And finally, I presented this last year briefly. Uh, there's a film and analysis extension that I've generated over the last year and a half or so that will give you some unique tools within the film and um, module that will give you some new statistics, some new features that will kind of add to the functionality and the complexity of the analysis of the results within a filament object, comparing filament to spots, looking for bouton detection, uh, and also measuring intensity of the filaments and spines within a, uh, a reconstructed filament. Um, so Anna did a really great job defining what Imaris extensions are, so I'm not going to get into a whole lot of detail on that. What I'd like to more focus on are, are some of the online resources that I've used to kind of train myself uh, to do the extensions. All the extensions that are built into the software are freely available within uh, the BitPlane installation, so you can always look at the code and see how the extensions that are existing, how they work, and that's how I taught myself. Uh, and using this detailed program interface within the help menu in Amaris, you can view, uh, programmers would find this probably very, very helpful uh, to learning how to code and get the different information and build Amaris tools uh, within, within the MATLAB script. Um, Everyone has this free access to Amaris Open. You may or may not be aware of this. This is a forum where all of my extensions and all other extensions presented uh, to the global Amaris community that upload their extensions there that you have free access to. Most of these are MATLAB-centric uh, extensions. Some of them are also using Python as well. Um, so you do have to have a kind of a full version of MATLAB to get access to them. But you can download them. You can ask questions of the developers of these extensions. You can ask questions on your own extension coding and so forth and so on. So you have this avenue to kind of ask questions. Um, other options uh, for people that are kind of getting interested in coding. Uh, the most common way that I usually recommend people to do is find a computer programmer in your department or outside of your department that can help you code with the analysis. There's plenty of people out there that are much better at it than I am, uh, that they're trained for this type of coding, they're really good at it, they're very efficient at it, and they can really much, pretty much do anything for the most part that you ask them to do it, as long as the, the tools are there available within the XT and Amaris interface. Um, second option is to teach yourself, which is what I did over about a period of three years or so, tinkering with the code on my own time, trying to figure out how things work, uh, what, what can the software do, what can XT do, what it can't do, um, and giving that thing. Uh, there's also a bunch of online courses through MATLAB. Uh, Python is a free service, but it also is something that's freely available uh, to train. I'm sure there's a lot of online resources to train yourself on using Python programming as well. Now, just a point of note, BitPlane does not really provide any detailed training on coding custom extensions or scripts uh, that communicate with, with uh, MRS. Uh, however, if there's a bug or something wrong with one of our existing extensions, we will help you uh, address that and, and develop that. But we don't have any, currently we don't have any way of kind of one-on-one -on -one personalized training uh, of how to make these scripts um, uh, in, in moving forward. Um, however, we will try to help you as best we can to kind of get you started and point you in the right direction to kind of help you uh, um, get into that. My goal today is to make it uh, available to everyone. I want you to be able to say, oh yeah, that's something that I can do. I, I see the code. I'm not going to really present much of any of the code today. Um, if you're interested, you know, we can go over it at some point just uh, briefly and talk about things like that. Um, however, you know, it's more a concept. I want to show you that these things are possible within Amaris. So, First thing, how do you set up these custom extensions within the software? Some of you have already downloaded extensions from Amaris Open and applied them to Amaris. Uh, it's very simple in the, in the newer versions of Amaris to kind of set up uh, custom extensions. Anything you download from the software from the Amaris Open, you're going to get either an MP file or a compiled file that you're going to be able to add to the folders that contain the extensions within the Applications folder. Uh, I'm showing you it here in the PC. In the Mac, it's a little bit different. It's in the Applications folder, but it's in generally the same position. Uh, there's going to be a MATLAB folder in Program Files, BitPlane, and Morris, uh, MATLAB, and RT MATLAB. The MATLAB folder will have the full version of the MATLAB files. The RT MATLAB have the compiled versions that we have built into the software. As I said, some of my extensions are compiled, but the majority of the extensions on Amaris Open are not compiled, so you do have to have a full version of MATLAB for many of them. Um, so this is where you would add this folder for the data set. I have a way of creating a custom folder 
Um, so I don't put my folders, my custom uh, scripts inside these folders. I create a, a, an old, my own folder for custom scripts, and then I add that folder in the advanced preferences, custom tools, add that folder. Uh, the reason you want to do that is because every time we have a new version, uh, you will have to move those custom scripts to the new version of the software. Any patch release, any new number release will have a new folder there that you'll have to add any custom scripts. If you add a separate folder, all you have to do is to add the, the custom script folder that you have applied. Once you have the extensions loaded and they're shown up in your Amaris, they're going to show up in two places. One of them is going to show within the tab within Amaris. Now again, it depends on the code. Some of the codes uh, in Amaris Open, they're, they're not uh, as um, the coding may, may, may show in one or two places. It's going to show in the tab within the surpass scene. There's a little gear icon, and it'll be listed here within the spots or the surface um, tab that you have within the, within, the surpass, within the surpass scene. Other places it's going to show up. All of them are going to show up. It's within the image processing tab. There's going to be a drop down of the image processing. And at the bottom there, if your tabs are all active and, and MATLAB is installed or the runtime is installed, the MATLAB compiler, they will show up here as extensions and you can run them from these tabs as well. So that being said, uh, let's just jump in and start getting and get started with some of these extensions uh, and kind of show you what, what some of the things you can do. And the way I'm going to run this, like I said, these are real data, real experiments. Uh, however, I'm just going to just focus on the output on the results. I have all the data pre-processed. So I'm not going to really run these extensions here because I don't want it to kind of take time uh, to run the extensions. But I'm going to show you the results. I'll show you some of the menus. I'll show you what the output of these data could be and how we could, how you can use that. So again, I want you to think when I present this is that how can I, how, think about how you could use it for your data. Uh, if it's not exactly the same, maybe we can think about ways of making it work for your particular experiment. So I'm going to start with uh, uh, my most recent extension called, uh, I, I call it a kiss and run analysis. It's essentially a, a surface-to-surface -surface interaction um, extension where we have uh, a single surface that we've reconstructed. Uh, I, I call it the target or the reference surface. This surface is something that you want to measure another surface uh, in relation to. So you, you do, we're going to do what's called a, a distance. One of the options here is we're going to just basically measure the distance of the closeness of one surface to the other and track this distance over time. And if it is overlapping or it's touching or it's within a particular distance of that target surface, we're going to you know, call that a kiss event or a, a contact event. Uh, and basically, we're going to quantify that event. Now, a lot of this extension can be done kind of outside of having an extension. What the benefit of having an extension does is that you don't do have to do any of the analysis outside of a Mars. So a lot of times people have done this in the past. I've worked with people to do this kind of kiss and run analysis. And they've exported the data out as Excel, and then they do the analysis, and they create macros. They create stuff in Excel. They kind of do modifications in Excel and things like that. And it gets a little bit time consuming. It's, it's something that's not very convenient. Here we've kind of I've grouped it together, done it all within MATLAB, which is a very powerful uh, tool to kind of analyze this data. And we can generate the statistics inside of Mars. So you have the data pre-calculated within, within the Mars application. And there's basically two ways that we're going to be measuring this. This extension has two options. One, it's going to look at surface-to-surface -surface overlap and surface-to-surface -surface, uh, a distance transformation, which you'll be able to kind of make a contact event, not necessarily if they're overlapping, but by a distance threshold. So you can make it one micron, two microns. If these surfaces are within one, within one micron of each other, you can call that, you can call that as a contact event. Um, you can set that threshold to whatever you want, or you can just use whatever is overlapping with each other. And those are the, the two options. And they're, they're, they're slightly different uh, in the process. So let me just show a brief screenshot of some examples of what it's going to look like in the result. This pink cell is just highlighted here. So we're, contacting the, we're tracking the green cells in this example. The blue cells is something that we're going to measure too. So you can see here I'm, I'm measuring uh, distance to target. So I'm measuring this green this red cell. As you can see, you get this distance to target. You have this little peak of the, the distance to the closest target. And you can see at that peak, it's this time point right here where it's not touching any of the blue surfaces. Uh, and then you have you know, contact, contact, no contact, no contact. And you can plot this information on a track by track basis. And you can plot and export this as a tracked object and get that data out and kind of plot that information. So this is kind of the individual surface uh, statistics. Uh, and this is what we're going to show. So at, that being said, I'm going to go ahead and uh, switch now to uh, 
MRS and show you the actual MRS result and what it'll look like inside the software. Um, so this pink cell is the one that we're going to be looking at today, just focusing on. I'm going to zoom in a little bit so we can see it. Um, so you can see the track starts here at time, point, at time frame 3. And if we rotate around this guy, let me center it a little bit here. So this guy here, you can see, if we rotate it around here, you can see it's physically touching this blue cell. Uh, and when we look at the statistics of this particular guy, open up this here, you can see you know, when it's touching and when it's not touching. As we move forward in the time lapse, you can see the time moving within the data set here. Uh, when it's touching and when it's not touching. So, uh, you know, this is just a way of monitoring the data. And this will give you the distance to target. So say if you didn't really want to track it over time, you just want to do a distance to target, you can do this on a single time point and measure the distance of all objects to some fixed object or surface within your data set. So this, in theory, can be used on a single 3D data set or a time lapse. Time lapse is nice because you, you, if you're doing this kiss and run, you're going to get this information uh, throughout the whole time lapse, whether the, the, the entire distance to that particular target. In addition to this distance to target, um, you're going to get a, a whole listing of new statistics that are generated inside the software. Uh, all of them are track-related statistics that will give you, for example, the number of contacts with the target. So if I click on this number of contacts with the target, you can see this one here that's highlighted, that pink one. Over the time of that target, time of that track, rather, there's eight contacts with the blue surface. So you have this information within the software to kind of export now. You can export these statistics. You can plot these statistics in Vantage. Uh, you can do a bunch of different things with, the, with this particular uh, result now that you have these new results. Again, this new result is something that we did not have with the kind of the built-in features in Amaris. This is a custom statistic that is very easily generated in Amaris XT. So you can even think of other statistics for example, that you may be interested in. You can modify this particular extension and say, oh, no, I don't want this statistic. I want to calculate this on this particular data set. It wouldn't be too far of a stretch to calculate that with using this current. You can modify my extension and, and add a new statistic that you're specifically interested in, uh, you know, basic uh, analysis of that particular result. And again, this is the listing of the extension. If you download the extension, I do have a really detailed, I try to be as detailed as I can to explain what the statistics are and what, what the extension is actually doing. In addition to the individual track statistics, which also is very interesting, is that you could also get uh, some general overall statistics uh, on per time point basis. So for example, number of contacts per time point. This is sampling every single one of these green cells relative to the blue cells. So we have, we segmented the blue cells, we, seg we segmented the green cells, and we're saying how many of them are in contact. So this is a percentage or oh, this is just a pure number, rather, I'm sorry. So 57, 57 contacts are at time point, at this particular time point, and you can see the track over time. And then here I also counted, cal calculated the percentage for each um, time point. This is the percentage of green cells that are contacted at any particular time point. So you can monitor this over time, and you can kind of, kind of get a general ebb and flow of how many of these cells are in contact with, with other objects. And so that's kind of the basic process here. Very, very straightforward, surface-to-surface -surface interaction and creating some, some nice custom statistics. Um, that being said, there is a second method within the, within the kiss and run analysis, and that is the surface overlap. I'm not going to go over this uh, as, as detailed. The same statistics are created here that are created with the previous one that I showed. However, the difference here is, and the one that I showed before was the distance transformation, which basically you set a set threshold. You set zero if they're overlap, you can set it to one micron, you can set it to two micron, and you can measure the interaction or the association based on this distance threshold. The difference between that one and this one is this one is actually looking for overlap between the surface masks. We actually create a mask of the blue, a mask of the green, and we're going to look for the physical overlap of the voxels that are inside of this mask. If there's overlap, that surface is going to be considered a, co a, a contact event. If there's no overlap, it's going to be a non-contact event. And that's what we're going to basically quantify with this particular mode of the extension. The main difference with this one and the other one 
is that it is a little bit slower because it has to do it on a per object basis. So if you have, for example, this particular example I think has about 1,600 surfaces, it took a few minutes to run uh, for it to complete the process. However, the difference is with this particular extension, um, you, get a different, you get a new statistic called a surface mask volume overlap, uh, the surface overlap volume. So this actually shows you how much of each surface is overlapping, not whether it is or whether it isn't. It will actually give you a volume of overlap. So if you did a really nice job of reconstructing these surfaces and you want to be able to say how much of these surfaces are actually physically overlapping, you can actually measure that with this particular extension. And you're going to get a volume measurement based on the masked voxels that are overlapping with each other. And again, if we look at this particular example here, we can plot this over time and you can see the volume of overlap. Uh, goes in and out with, uh, with over time with that particular extension. Um, in addition to that, uh, as part of another extension that I'm not going to get into today, it's kind of built into this particular extension, but it is a, a surface, colloq surface. So this is, will actually, doesn't do anything except more of a display, but it does it over time, but it's going to actually show you where, which part of the surface is overlapping with the, with the blue. So you can kind of see here, it's in a kind of ugly gray color. Um, I can make it a little bit flashier here, make it yellow. So this yellow is your co-localized surface uh, of the green object. This is the region of the green that's overlapping with the blue. So you have to physically see the overlap and get, this is where that volume overlap is coming from. Uh, so you can visually see that where, the, where that overlap is. Uh, within the data set. Like I said, I have a specific extension that is already on MRS Open as well that just does the surface overlap uh, and creates this co-localized surface. It doesn't do anything about measuring the statistics or anything like that. It's very basic and creates this co-local surface uh, within the process. So that is essentially the, the surface overlap. Let me go back to my presentation. So that's the, that's the kiss and run analysis. So I need to kind of speed up a little bit here. Um, so again, in, in summary, the two methods are listed here. And again, if you download the extension, I do have a PDF kind of explaining this kind of in, in, a, in, enough, in a little bit more detail about exactly how each of these methods are processed. Again, this method one is kind of the default method. I think it's a little bit faster. It's a little bit more um, powerful in the sense that you could set the distance of the contact event, whether it's zero microns or one micron, two microns, 1.2 microns, whatever you feel is kind of your definition of a contact event. Again, you know, it depends on the resolution that you require. You know, confocal microscopy has a limited resolution, but you can define that that contact event but based on this particular threshold. Um, uh, method two is very different in the sense that it is a contact event determined by the overlap of the two surfaces and creates that new statistic that I mentioned. Okay, so let's move on to the second extension that I'd like to contact, uh, talk to you about. Um, it is a, another type of co-localization and uh, another type of interaction between two different surfaces. However, it's a little bit different uh, and it's a little bit more unique. Uh, and it's, a, it's an extension that has been uh, a long, uh, long in the making, but it's something that we've been able to do for, for a number of years now. Uh, after working with uh, Arvon, another one of the US supporters, we kind of created this tool inside of Mars using an extension, using a, a unique way of looking at the data and generating this surface to kind of uh, see this interaction between two surfaces, uh, to measure this contact area between one surface and another surface. Uh, so you can see in this little screenshot of the example, basically um, we have a reference object. In this case, it's a neuron that we've created a surface rendering of. Uh, the second surface isn't just shown here. It's a, it was a green surface that we're going to see how much of that green surface is, is actually physically overlapping with the red surface, but just at the surface of that red surface. We only want to display what's physically right at the surface. So we don't want to actually show the complete overlap because in theory, these objects aren't really overlapping <coughs> in real space, in science, and you know, in the real, this is a retinal ganglion cell, in real in real science, they're not actually overlapping. These neurons, uh, or two neurons, are actually touching each other at these points, and they're actually points of synaptic contact. Uh, and that's what has been shown uh, in the research. But in, in the idea, well, we try to want to measure how much of the green is actually in contact with the red. Uh, based on the confocal imaging and the quality of the imaging, we can get a really nice estimate and a really nice dis display of where exactly 
these neurons are interacting with each other. And again, you can use this for any type of science, any broad science field where you want to look at the interaction between two surfaces. Now, there's one caveat here with this analysis, uh, and it will not run without having isotropic voxel scaling. Uh, this is basically due to the fact that we need to make this surface, because we are actually making a one voxel thick shell, if you will, around this red surface. And we're analyzing that shell, and we're looking at the labeling of the other mass inside of this shell, this one voxel thick shell around the outside of this red surface. And without doing this isotropic voxel filling, isotropic voxels, if you're not familiar with it, are technically a voxel, an XYZ voxel scaring, where the XY and Z voxel sizes are equal. Um, and most times, most general confocal imaging uh, parameters do not have isotropic voxels. Um, and what this means is that we'll have to actually modify your data or resample your data in the z-plane to make the voxel sizes equal. Um, it's very easy to do. And inside the extension, I can possibly even show it to you, it will give you a dialog box. If it is not isotropic, like I said, it won't run. It'll cancel out and say, hey, if you change your z-step size by this amount, then you could uh, run the extension. It actually tells you exactly what it should be sent. It does the calculation for you. You don't have to know how to calculate isotropic voxels uh, to convert your data set. It actually does it for you, but you have to actually physically do it. The extension doesn't do it, unfortunately, but you have to go into a Mars, uh, and I'll show you where you can do it um, to modify your data. So as I said, the output is a one voxel thick, unsmoothed surface that surrounds the primary object where they overlap. And it creates a custom stat now. Again, comes back to these custom stats, which I think is the power I feel like is a really powerful tool inside MRS uh, XT, uh, creating a percentage of surface area coverage uh, compared to the overall surface that we're analyzing. So that being said, let's go ahead. Whoops, go ahead and open up this data set. Okay. And as I said, this is a, uh, a retinal ganglion cell that I've analyzed for a number of years for several different applications. Uh, this particular one, I think, is really uh, a quite telling uh, result. Um, so I was able to generate you know, a very simple surface of the data set. The raw data is very clean. So the surface, you know, this is your raw data. It's very clean um, and a very uh, uniform labeled cell. So we were able to make a really nice surface of this. The green that you see on the outside is what is called a, a chat amacrine cell. It's a, it's a, it's a, a secondary neuron uh, inside the retina. Uh, and in fact, this retinal ganglion cell has a, has a fair amount of contact within uh, with that amacrine cell. However, it's really hard to see during co-localization, um, anything like that. Even in the slice mode, um, you can't, it's really hard to tell exactly where it's contact. But you see all this green and the red. There's a lot of overlap. There's, I've actually really, really a lot of overlap with these two neurons. It's very, very telling. This is a really nice example to show um, that this neuron and these fibers are in the same plane. But you want to be able to maybe quantify how many contacts, or how much is the overlap within the data set. So what we were able to do is we make two surfaces. We make a surface of the ganglion cell. Let me turn off the volume here. Made a surface of the retinal ganglion cell, and then you make a surface of the chat amacrine cell. Uh, I, I can't, I'm not going to display it here because it, it's very, it's a really complicated surface necessarily. Um, actually, I can't. I can see if I can do it here. Display it, but it's not going to, it's going to be pretty messy because it's, it's a huge surface that it's generated within the data set. And what we're trying to quantify is the contact between this surface that we're seeing here in green that's pretty messy and everywhere uh, in the green, and again, we made that surface with the red surface. And the end result is a result that looks like this. Let me turn the game and so on. And the end result is that it's a surface that looks like this. I'm going to zoom in and show you. is a surface rendering that is a one voxel thick surface on the edge of this guy that's measuring the, the contact, if you will, of the green with the red surface. Uh, and it's, it's a very nice image uh, showing you know, how much of this particular object is overlapping. Uh, and as I said, if you go to the statistics tab, you have a, a new overall statistic in this particular case, surface area coverage. So it's telling you, at least in this particular example, with the settings and the surfaces that I created, you have a 31, just approximately 31% coverage of the retinal ganglion cell is covered by this 
this secondary neuron contacting the cell. So it's a really nice way of quantifying the results of two surfaces that you've generated within a MARS. And again, MARS is already really powerful in creating these surfaces. It's now just a matter of kind of using this to correlate them together and get a result like this. And again, you can imagine using this for several different types of experiments, not just neurons. It could be cells. It could be vesicles. It could be any kind of surface that you can render in 3D that you want to kind of look at the relationship or the coverage of one surface with another. Maybe blood vessels would be one, another one that might be work well, as long as you can make a surface of the, of the vessel um, uh, as well to kind of measure that um, overlap within the data set. So that is essentially the, the surface uh, contact area extension. This is already, as well, already on the Mars Open and available um, uh, within the Mars Open as well. Okay, so let's move on to the next one. Next one is one that came apart, came um, due to some conversations with the, our U.S. sales team and some of the applications that customers were asking us to be able to analyze. Uh, and it seemed uh, a simple enough task to be able to kind of do this type of analysis in a Mars. Now, now kind of a built-in process in a Mars, uh, not necessarily something that's um, a huge project, but the concept is pretty straightforward, and it's a biofilm analysis extension. And essentially, uh, what many people want with these biofilms, I'm not, I'm not as familiar with the actual science of the biofilms as some of you may be, um, but the idea is, in general, you want to be able to measure the thickness of this biofilm and potentially measure this over time, uh, measure the localized thickness within the data set, or even possibly look at to objects within this particular data set. So this is kind of a work in progress to a certain degree, but we're able right now to measure a very set number of statistics within a surface reconstructed uh, in a Mars from a, from a biofilm data set. Um, and basically what we're able to calculate right now is mean thickness, a max thickness, and a roughness coefficient or variance uh, value. Uh, in addition to that, we're able to generate a, a localized heat map, uh, as seen here in this little snapshot, that will show you where the thickest part of this biofilm data is. Uh, a couple of other features here that are different from some of this, whoops, different from some, whoops, um, some of the free tools out there, whether ImageJ or the other one I think is Constat uh, available, is that we can auto-detect the substratum, which is kind of the bottom layer of the biofilm if you're not familiar with that. Uh, we can detect where that substratum start is, because that's where we want to measure our thickness from. We don't necessarily want to measure the thickness of the whole volume, because maybe your imaging doesn't start right at the bottom, and maybe a couple slices or a few slices before you start imaging your biofilm where it's kind of just empty space. You want to be able to kind of measure that and identify where the bottom of your substratum is as, as best as we possibly can. And like I said, I would definitely love to, to talk with any of you who would be interested in using this particular extension and making it a little bit better uh, to getting the answers that you that you require to kind of have this tool be as best as it can be. Um, but then we calculate some other things, biomass and biovolume. Uh, as you can see, a little snapshot here. This is kind of the dialog box that you'll see. And there's a lot of things in here um, uh, to talk about within the biofilm process. Um, and I'll go into most some of them uh, today. Um, if you have any questions on it, again, I do have a really detailed uh, PDF uh, that's attached to this particular extension goes into detail exactly what each one of these tools do. I'll try to uh, get the, the, the main points uh, today so that you're at least aware of what it is actually doing and how it's measuring and what the result will actually look like. So let's go ahead and open up this data set. This is a, uh, a surface of a biofilm that was created. Um, for example, you have a 3D volume that's generated here. Uh, and you can kind of see it doesn't, if you turn it up on its side, you can see it doesn't go all the way to the bottom. So we're able to kind of measure the thickness from the bottom of this surface that's created within this volume. Um, uh, the, the extension currently works best if the volume um, is flat within the data set, and that's the majority of the ones that I am familiar with. That's usually the case, that there's, there's not a whole lot of slant within the biofilm, but it, it does depend on having a nice, uh, even, flat surface to get to kind of the most accurate uh, distance um, measures uh, within the biofilm to the bottom of that particular surface. So let's just say you have a surface like this that is a biofilm that you want to analyze. Uh, within that extension, let me run, I'm just going to open it up so we have it open here. Um, so again, just to show, because I didn't really show you where those extensions are, um, uh, if you click on the surface and you click the little gear tab, here you're going to have all your extensions that you could run uh, very quickly and easily. All the built-in ones and any custom ones that you've added. We'll 
probably show up here in this particular window. For example, here's biofilm analysis. You would click on this. It will launch uh, XT or, or it'll launch MATLAB runtime, either one, uh, and you'll get a little dialog box that looks like this. Inside this dialog box, we have a bunch of different options here. Um, there's a bunch of the statistics down here I'm not going to get into. Uh, the more uh, general topics here uh, are for biofilm analysis using kind of the overall calculation of the entire surface volume, um, considering this surface as being altogether one object. Um, and that's you, this overall calculation. It's going to create some overall statistics that we're going to look at. Um, you can, and it's built into this particular extension as well, you can measure individual surface thicknesses. So if you were measuring cells that you wanted to, um, yeah, that you're tracking over time or something like that, you can actually measure the individual surface thicknesses of objects over time as well. Uh, for biofilm data, that's really not very useful. Again, this is something I put in there because it's something that I think maybe some people might be interested in moving forward. Overall, calculations is for the biofilm folks that's going to measure the thickness of this particular object. So we have several ways of measuring that thickness. One is purely the surface mask, right? So this basically would measure, if you check this button and you don't check anything else, this is going to measure the actual thickness of the data set uh, from top to the bottom of the surface, regardless of the substratum, regardless of anything, it's all dependent upon the surface. So if you measure from, from this particular point, you can see there's a little bit of a divot in there. It's going to measure the top to bottom x, y distance of a voxel within that surface mask. And that's the value that you're going to get uh, within that data set if you check this. Um, more relevant to the biofilm folks would be this biovolume named biovolume. This will basically measure the thickness from the top of your volume to the bottom of your substratum, which is defined uh, either automatically or defined by you setting the, the slice level where it's going to measure from. Um, and you're going to get that thickness value. And it's going to be no gaps. So it's going to measure from the top here to the bottom of the substratum and just literally count the voxels in the vertical plane that are in there. So if you have 10 voxels up and down, it's going to, be, that's going to, it's going to give you a, a measurement of thickness based on the size of your voxel and the height of that column. And then you're going to get that value, and it's going to do that through for every single voxel within the data set. And what you're going to end up getting is a result. I'm going to turn this off. I'm going to look at the heat map. You're going to get a result that looks kind of like this. This is a heat map showing where the thickest part of your substratum is relative to the bottom. The thickest part of your biofilm relative to the substratum, so the ones that are red here are the ones where those uh, big swellings were within the volume. You can kind of see that these guys here are obviously the highest, biggest structures in there. So those are the ones that are turning up red when I look at, uh, in this uh, 2D slice mode, uh, this heat map measurement. Uh, and you can get that value. And what you end up getting as an output here is within this overall tab, you have a whole bunch of values here. Uh, we calculate the biovolume. Uh, a continuity coefficient is something I threw in there that I thought would be interesting. Uh, again, look at our PDF. It'll describe what that is and how that is measured. Um, basically, it's a measure of the, the continuity of the biofilm and the rendering of the surface, uh, essentially. But we also have max thickness and mean, th mean thickness of the values. Uh, you know, the one that's most important is the biofilm measure, measuring the thickness of the biofilm um, from the substratum, it's giving you a value of 13.2 microns. The whole, it's the average of the whole biofilm um, from all the individual voxels in the data set. That's your kind of your average mean thickness of the biofilm. And this is often what these biofilm uh, researchers are looking for. Um, again, it's not a complete tool for every single uh, biofilm statistic out there, but it's, it's a start of having a way of measuring that thickness now uh, within a 3D surface rendered inside of a Mars. Uh, before this, there really wasn't really a way to do that. Because we really do a great way of rendering in a Mars. That's our strong suit. We can render in 3D. We can render large surfaces in 3D. Uh, and we can measure this thickness rather quickly using that biofilm tool to render that very, very, very quickly. Um, there is another tool in here. I'm not going to get into it. It's a much longer uh, uh, description and dis uh, measurement of that. Uh, I can measure kind of the subvoxel distance of this, the subvoxel thickness of this um, biofilm surface. Uh, as you may or may not know, when we create a surface when inside of a Mars, um, the surface object is subvoxel based, which means that you know these 
vertices that make up these surfaces don't necessarily occur on particular slices. They can occur anywhere within the 3D space. And so what that subvoxel measurement does is it renders those vertices on the surface and measures the thickness based on those vertices to the substratum, uh, a vertical distance of the substratum, and it measures it that way. Uh, the biofilm measure, which is a much more faster and efficient way, measures the thickness based on the number of voxels inside of the mask of the biofilm. Now, as you can see, if you look over here, the measurements are almost identical, um, rounded to the, to the first decimal point. They're actually exactly the same. Um, so either way, it's going to give you probably the same, very close to the same answer. But the buyer volume is a much faster way of doing it, especially because the surface rendering is rather large, relatively speaking, the number of vertices that it has to analyze. Uh, the, the thickness of the biofilm, as long as the Z step is relatively um, normal and not too large, um, the measurement here for the, the, the mean thickness is, is a really good estimate of the thickness of this object in the 3D space. Again, think about the options you have here for measuring the thickness. Uh, again, it was meant for biofilm people, but it has some, some other uses, I think, that are important to kind of think about and see what, see what we can do. And again, if anyone has any thoughts about improving it, what other statistics would be possible within this software, within the XT um, domain, you know, I'd be more than happy to discuss that with you to kind of make it um, a little bit more of a, a, a full-featured biofilm tool uh, to answer even additional questions out there since I'm not a biofilm scientist. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm definitely up to, to hearing thoughts on, on making any of these extensions better, uh, especially my extensions. Um, you know, I'd, I'd be happy to, to hear, hear thoughts on, on some of the people if you have any thoughts. OK, so that's the biofilm extension uh, in a nutshell. It's, it's pretty straightforward uh, and fairly easy to use. Again, uh, there's, not a, there's a bunch of inputs there. But again, I try to describe in the, in the PDF on how to use those particular extensions. So finally, um, I'm going to go to um, my film and analysis extension. Now, this one was uh, been in my mind for a number of years uh, from um, starting uh, at Bitplain. Uh, I've been in. Um, I did my research uh, in neuroscience. Many of you may or may or may not know. Uh, so my background is in neuroscience. I published a lot of papers on tracing neurons. Uh, morphology of neurons, getting some information on neurons. So you know, being able to kind of uh, come into to, uh, Bitplane and kind of bring that knowledge into, into Bitplane, um, I've, I thought I could, I could make this uh, film analysis even a little bit better than what we already have. Our film tool is, is fantastic. It does fast tracings. It does fine morphologies. It does a lot of things. Um, it doesn't do everything. Um, uh, and you know, the things that it doesn't do, it's, it's you know, we can do some of those things within the modest extensions. And, and bringing that knowledge to film analysis is something that I've wanted to do for a number of years. And I just didn't have the, the programming know-how to do it uh, until uh, recently as a, as, as a few years ago. Oops, sorry about that. Go back. back here. So what do I want to talk about film analysis? Film analysis is a full-featured extension. It does a bunch of stuff uh, within a filament object. Um, the goal of this is that you have to have, the requirement of this is that you have to have a filament that has been traced in filament using the filament module and has been, has a really accurate measurement of the actual diameter of the filament object. If you can't really measure a really nice thickness of the diameter of the object, whether the labeling is poor, this may not work as nicely uh, for you uh, for, uh, for certain types of data. But if you, can if you can render your filament object, your filament tracing, with a really nice model within a marsh, which usually looks really nice, um, this particular extension might be something you might want to look into for doing some, some interesting other uh, types of experiments that may fit your particular needs within the data set. First thing it does, the first thing I wanted it to do was to measure dendrite diameter, measure dendrite and spine intensities. Um, for each channel within the data set. So if you're labeling with a, a green marker and you want to measure red intensity, you're going to be able to get an average mean intensity uh, and an average intensity center along these spines that are, are labeling. And I'll, I'll go into a little bit of detail exactly how I am measuring this within MRSXT. It's a little bit of a unique way of doing it. And you may or may not like it, but it, it gives you a really good estimate, I think, of, of the intensities along the path of these fibers. In addition, I've made some improvements to spots close to dendrite, or spots close to filament, which is a built-in extension within Amaris. Um, so this is very similar to that. 
The only difference with this particular extension is that Spot's Close to Filament, the one that's built into the software, is great, but it only gives you a general number of the number of spots for the entire filament. So it'll tell you that you have 50 spots that are close to a particular filament. Um, what this does, and by nature of the way I wrote the extension, I am going segment by segment, and you get the number of spots per dendrite segment. So you can get the number of spots on each individual segment, in addition to getting the overall number of spots per filament. But it's going to give you it on a segment by segment basis on how many of the spots are within a particular distance of a filament segment. Um, it's just a little bit different, a little bit new statistic that is available um, to, to measure kind of a little bit higher level of, of detail within the spots close to filament um, extension. Again, another new extension, a uh, new feature, oh, shoot. Um, Another new feature of the filament analysis um, is something that I've already showed to several people, and, and so far I've had pretty good response to, uh, and that is finding dendritic boutons or, or filaments, uh, or uh, boutons along a filament or a dendrite. Um, I call them varicosities when I was in when I was in um, doing my PhD work. Um, these varicosities are a real physical morphological feature of neurons. Uh, in particular regions of the brain and retina, these are real things that people want to be able to measure. And when you have these varicosities or these boutons, um, we need a way, people and I in particular would love to have a way to count these, measure these, get a density, get a size, get all sorts of things with that. And so what this extension offers now is a way of using the dendrites that you trace, using the dendrite diameters that you calculated, and actually find points of interest along the filament that meet a certain criteria to identify that as a swelling. So basically it's looking for a region where the, the local intensity is larger than the local, the local thickness of the filament on either side of that peak of intensity. So we're basically looking for peaks of, intense, uh, peaks of radius size that are along the path of this fiber. And so we're able to identify those, we place a spot on them, quantify them, get those numbers. And I'll show you an example of that as well. Um, in addition, we're able to generate a series of spots based on the filament model. And this is basically how we're generating the spine intensities. But this also has a couple other options in it where you can actually visualize the actual points that make up the filament trace. It's made up of a series of filament points along the path. And I place a spot at each one of those points. Uh, and what's nice about this, and I'll show you an example of this over time, where you can actually copy these points, copy these spots, over time to a particular point, and you can measure, for example, uh, intensity of a spine or a dendrite at a particular point uh, in time and measure, for example, changes in intensity for, for example, either calcium analysis or any kind of, kind of increase in intensity over time from a live imaged uh, filament or uh, uh, object that you've traced uh, within, a, within a time lapse. You have that option. I will show you an example of that as well. Um, and then we have an option here to generate filament points objects. This is something that was already part of a different extension that's built into the software. It's kind of hidden, and you may have may not have even been aware of it, but it was part of a, of a filament uh, points track extension um, that's in MRS still. However, it's built into here. It's an identical extension. Basically, it's going to add a spot at the beginning point, dendritic branch points, dendritic terminal points, spine attachment points, spine terminal points. So it's going to place a spot at those points uh, in your filament trace. Um, it's a way of identifying those points in space, quantifying them, visualizing where they are, color coding them, those sorts of things. And you can do a bunch of other things uh, with those points, uh, tracking them and, and other things as well uh, within the filament object. And again, let me get right into the filament data set, and I'll show you some of this, and then we'll open it up for some questions. So, Start with the bouton detection because I think this is really cool. Um, so let's just say you have a filament that looks something like this. This is the raw data. You know, not a bad filament. You have a, a you have a, a dendrite that comes in here, has a couple branches, and you trace your data, and it looks something like oops, it looks something like that. Once you're all done, you trace your data. This is the output of a Mars. It's a really elegant. View. Mars does a really great job of displaying this in a really nice and clear, concise way. It looks beautiful. It looks like a real neuron in my book. Uh, it's a really nice rendering of the, the data set and the trace. 
the swellings and everything are defined very, very well. Um, because we can see, clearly see there's swellings along this path, we want to be able to find where these swellings are. Um, sometimes you can do this with just spot detection. This is how people have done it in the past, where they're just going to do a spot detection and find areas of a particular size, because usually they're higher intensity. I don't know if they are in this particular. Yeah, usually they're higher intensity. And you can often place a spot object at these points. However, that's not always the best way of identifying the swellings. You want to be able to kind of identify them based on the relative size of the dendrite um, along the path of the dendrite. And so what we're able to do is part of the first part of the extension is to generate um, is to generate a series of points along the dendrite. Again, these are the points that generated the, di the thickness of the diameter. So you can tell this kind of looks very similar to what the filament object actually looks like. It kind of, you can see it fills it in very much identically to where the filament. So these spots are representing the thickness of the dendrite at those particular points. And so essentially what this extension does is it's looking at the, the intensity, the radius, or the diameter of these spots along the path of the dendrite. And we're going to basically try to identify where these points of swelling are uh, with a code within MATLAB that basically looks for peak, local peaks within the path of this dendrite. And so when it's all said and done, you're going to get something that looks like this. Oops. Turn on here. You're going to get the path here. I've, I've, I've made it a little bit transparent. You're going to get a spot that's going to get placed uh, at each one of those swellings. Uh, within the extension, you do have a sensitivity setting. So the lower the sensitivity, you can pick up some of these smaller swellings. If you adjust and play with the sensitivity, you can have it uh, be a little bit more sensitive and pick up some of these smaller uh, things. Uh, the, the simple way it does it, it's basically almost a percentage of the surrounding um, diameters. Um, has to be within, I think, 30% or something like that. I don't remember the exact number. Um, uh, if it falls within that, it's going to place a spot at that particular point. And that spot is going to be a particular size. So not only do you get a quantification, you also get a size. So you can tell that it's a big varicosity or small varicosity within the data set. And again, it's a relative measure. So it, it's not just looking for one big spot. It's actually looking for the relative size, which is why the spot tool uh, in Amaris, which basically sets the spot diameter essentially to, to a single size, more or less. Um, it does have a region growing option. But this is actually using the actual path of the fiber to kind of define the size of that particular object and where that, where that peak should be placed and what the size of that particular object should be. And so now we have this value here. You have a whole bunch of stuff here that's generated. Again, this is a very complicated extension, and it was a long time coming. So it's, it's, it's not something I expect you to kind of look at the code. If you're a coder, to kind of be able to kind of jump into it and say what's doing what. It's, it's, pretty complicated. It works on the majority of the tests that I've run. Again, all of these are custom scripts. They're not um, written by BitPlane developers. They're not built into the software. They're not built into the software for a reason. They're, they're part of, of these, this custom tools that are added from, from our user base. And again, I am, I'm not only a user. Before I became with BitPlane, I was a user of the software uh, to a certain degree uh, at the NIH. But now I am, I'm, again, part of the team that is, is helping scientists even, even take it a little bit further now with, with extensions like this. So anyway, so what we have now is a whole bunch of statistics now. Um, let's see if this pops up here. So in this particular case, we have dendrite bouton density, which gives you the actual density of boutons per segment. So you can click on a segment. You can say it's 1.54 boutons per, per micron. Um, or you just get the, the raw number of boutons per segment. You know, this particular one has 11, this one has 10, this one has 7, so forth and so on. You have the actual number of boutons. Um, the size of the bouton, again, it's measured by the size of the objects, the size of the spots. The spots are here. Uh, I did not add that to the extension here, the average size of the bouton or anything like that. That could be easily added as a, as a custom statistic. But um, if you look here, these boutons are here. So you can look at the size of the boutons here. Looking at this particular statistic, you're just going to look at the diameter of the, of the spots. Oops. Uh, the diameter of the spots within the data set. You click on the big one, they're going to be the bigger spots. Let me do the diameter of X here. Right. So the biggest one here is 1.59. That's going to be, I don't know where that guy is. 
down here is the biggest guy. Uh, and then you can see you know, the bigger spots can be labeled. It gives you the actual size. It's a sphere, so they're all, the XYZ diameters are all going to be the same. But you can get a, 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 a distribution of the size of the, the varicosities within the data. So, okay, so a few more minutes, and I, will, uh, I do want to show you a few other things, and then I'll, I'll, I'll open it up to some questions if there's any, any questions. Um, so let me show you the intensity measure. So again, we went back to this, and we showed you uh, this filament tool here um, where you're creating a series of spots within the object. Now, the measurement of this object also does, uh, if we look at this guy, we can make it the intensity of these segments. Again, they're displayed up here as well. Uh, oh, no, they're not. Oh, yeah. Dendrite intensity uh, mean. This gives you the mean intensity of each one of these segments. Now, it's measuring this intensity from the whole segment. So this whole mean intensity of all those points, all those spots within that data set, we're basically taking the mean of all, intensity of all those spots in channel number one or channel number two. It does it for each of the channels that you have within your data set. But it's giving you a single average of that number. So if you went, for example, here, and you uh, want to do, a, for example, a statistics code, you can statistics code by intensity mean, and you're going to get something that looks like this, where you get you know a color coded mean showing you which ones are the you know which ones are the, the highest intensity segments. Here, here is the lower end. Here is the small end. Partly a factor of how long it is as well, depending on how big the sections are for the intensity. Now this is a nice tool. This is something that the base MRS does not currently do, uh, but it gives you a nice estimate of that intensity that was kind of missing from from the filament. Uh, module uh, within the software. So hopefully this will open it up for people to be able to use this to kind of get the intensity measures that they've been asking for um, within the software. Now we can take this one more step ahead, uh, and we can take this intensity measure that we've calculated based on those spots, and we can use it, for example, in measuring spines. So all this measures spines. It'll measure the intensity of the spines and dendrites. I'm only showing dendrites in this particular example. So I want to open up a data set now and show you a, a result that I find very interesting, and the, the applications here are, again, uh, somewhat uh, unlimited. Uh, I've done the same sort of thing. I'm not going to go into the filament, but we've traced a bunch of these segments manually. Uh, our filament looks like this. Uh, I didn't trace all of them, but I just traced some of them because it's a little bit of a mess. But it's a, a, a fixed cell on a slide, and there's a time lapse. And, and over time, these spines are shining brighter or dimmer over time based on um, the, the, the imaging uh, process that was imposed with this particular data set. So what we're able to do here, once we create these spots, I did two things. Um, and I've added uh, an extension here that's not quite listed on the uh, kind of an application tool. But it's essentially, uh, I traced the neurons at time point one. So this is time point one, right? So at time point one, I traced these neurons. And I traced from the end to the beginning, and I got these, these neurons, these segments traced. Um, because this is a time lapse, it's a fairly long time lapse, and it's fixed in space for the most part, and these dendrites don't move a fair bit. You can also do, you always do a drift correction or anything like that to kind of fix the, any drifting or anything. But this particular example is very nice. There's not a whole lot of drift. So once you create these filaments that I created, you know, again, these are the filaments that I, draw, that I drew originally. These are the original filaments with the spines that I drew manually within the data set to measure the spines. This is, the, the, this is what a Mars can do now, uh, measure the spines. You can do more spine morphology. You can get length. You can get size. You can get all sorts of things here within the data set. But what's missing is the intensity. And so I ran my extension, and I got a result that looks like this. Right? You get these series of spots. As, as I zoom in, let me zoom in to show you real quick. These are just spot objects. And you can see how it's just a spot object here within the filament, and it does it for every single filament in, in the field. However, this is nice. And so at this point, I can go ahead, I can take this data set, I can statistics code it, I can look at, uh, I can look at the intensity, uh, the intensity mean channel number one, and you can see the intensity at each of these individual points along the way. Again, these are spots, so I'm just measuring intensity mean channel one, intensity mean channel two, whatever channel you want to do, whatever channel you have in your data set, you could plot or export that intensity out. However, the idea here is that these spots are kind of fixed points in space. So I have an extension that I need to make available, I think, on a Mars Open yet. I'm not sure if it's there. Uh, it's basically a tool, uh, basically, to copy these spots to all time points. 
Uh, currently, we don't have that built into the software. We can copy surfaces to all time points, but copying spots to all time points uh, is something that the base software um, doesn't currently do. So anyway, it, it does that. So the reason I did that is because now I have these series of spots, and they're duplicated over time. You can see now I go to time point 10. You have time point 10 here, and you have the same spots. You go to time point 20, you have the same spots. But now you're still di displaying the intensity of those spots within the data set. And the nice thing about the copy spots to all time points that I created, not only does it just copy the spots to all time points, now you have an added function, whereas if we look at the statistics now of those spots, not only does it copy spots to all time points, it also connects those spots together. So each spot is identical in each particular time point. So I can pick, for example, a swelling. Oops. I can pick a spot here, for example, I'll pick I don't know where a good one is. I don't remember now. But I can pick a spot there within that dendra. Again, you can see me selecting it. It's a single spot. You only see part of it because there's, a, there's overlap between the spots. And that's something that's kind of inherent with the spot placement. Uh, so you kind of have to deal with that as part of the, the extension and the way the extension works. But basically, all we're doing is we're measuring the intensity inside of that spot. And if we go here now to intensity mean channel number one, and I'm going to look at, I'm going to open up, click here to open a time plot. What you see here, at that spot, you have the, the intensity of that spot over time. And I can play the movie so you can see it a little bit better. And hopefully it's not too fast. Um, but you can see where the white bar is, is a peak of intensity. And so in theory, you could use this to identify when that particular spot has a spike of fluorescence. And in here, you can kind of see these spikes out here. And so analyzing those spikes is something, I guess, more tuned to, to a real statistical program. But you can export this result out. That's the idea, is that you would take this, export the mean intensity over time. Each one of these spots would be uh, exported out separately. You can kind of find those spots that are uh, creating these peaks of activity. Now again, to make this a little bit more detailed, maybe you only want to analyze one spot per, one spot per, um, for varicosity, possibly, um, just to measure a kind of a varicosity or a spine or something along those lines. Again, you can do the same thing with exporting the whole spine intensity over time and plot the entire spine intensity, whether you want to do it at a single point. You can also do the duplicate to all time points with the um, bouton, right? So as, I, as you showed up here, oh, this doesn't have the boutons, but if you were to do a bouton detection, for example, you would get a single spot, and you could duplicate that over time. If it's again, if, if you don't have a significant amount of drift, and you can plot those the intensity of those boutons over time, and just get a single spot for every bouton, and then you can get a you know say you have 20, 20 synoptic varicosities of boutons, you can get a you know the average uh, the intensity over time for those individual boutons instead of having individual points. This is nice because you can kind of pick your points that you want to analyze, and it will analyze everything. You know, depending on where you pick, you can kind of see these peaks of intensity at these particular time points. And again. Uh, exporting that out and doing that kind of in a real statistical program is, is, is really the power. Really not, Mars isn't really built for that. You can do it in MATLAB as well. MATLAB is definitely built for that type of analysis. So in theory, uh, if you have some programming know-how and you get the result that I'm exporting out here as a, as a statistic, as an intensity, you could potentially do some, some interesting you know, uh, analyses inside MATLAB if you're familiar with kind of MATLAB coding and, and developing it inside of MATLAB and just kind of using this to generate the result, generating the spot, generating the point, and measuring that kind of over time. It's a really nice, unique way of doing it. Um, I like to kind of build it into software. That's why I kind of create these custom statistics, uh, I think a very powerful tool of MRS XT. And uh, that is something, again, it's built into the software. It's built into XT. It took me a little while to figure out. I am in the process of creating some um, XT cheat sheets for a lot of the things that I've done with a lot of these extensions uh, to make them available to people at some point. It's not quite there yet, but um, I, do, I will do that eventually. Um, so that is the extensions. Uh, let me go back to my talk real quick to summarize, and then we'll, we'll take a few questions. Um, so we saw this. These are some of the snapshots uh, from the data set. Um, just to finish up, um, the extensions we talked about are listed here on the left. Um, many of them do require MRS 8.2, so that if you do not have 8.2, there are a few uh, 
uh, scripts in there uh, within the coding that requires kind of an updated uh, MRS version. Kiss and Run has that requirement. Biofilm analysis does. Film analysis I don't believe does, and neither do the surface contact area or core localization. Those, those will pretty much work on, work on any version uh, of MRS. Um, other notable scripts uh, in MRS Open that you may be aware of um, uh, that I think are, are worth noting. Uh, some of them are really quite uh, interesting. Uh, I do encourage you to check them out. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail here, but they're, they're really nice uh, tools that kind of add on to the functionality of MRS. Surfaces Filler is one of our newer ones that is more of a visualization tool. Dilate Surfaces is a really nice tool, very similar to um, the surface surface contact area to a certain degree, um, but it does require, uh, the way it's written now, it does require the image processing toolbox in MATLAB. Uh, and some other tools that here that are, are worth noting. There, there's nice descriptions online. These, mo most of these are MATLAB related. Uh, you need a full version of MATLAB, but they're they're really nice. And if you do have that, they're worth checking out if they kind of fit your fit your research needs. Uh, and finally, um, again, I hopefully uh, in presenting these, you've kind of I've opened your eyes to to what some of the things that MRS and XT can do. Um, most of these they're not they're not groundbreaking. Um, uh, analyses tools. These are the things people have done for probably, probably a number of years. Um, but incorporating them into a kind of a 3D model, incorporating into our 3D model, which is kind of the, the, uh, the, the perfect 3D modeling of the object, and be able to kind of do this type of analysis on surface, between surfaces, on surface area, on the contact area, all these filament tools. Um, I, I, I want to be able to kind of uh, kind of bring these to your attention. Often past extensions that people have uh, that we've developed have sometimes come into and turned into full features within Amaris, which is not uncommon uh, to have that happen. Uh, in fact, it kind of already has happened with our recent release with Amaris Lineage. Um, these tools have uh, they develop into features because people want them to be full features within Amaris, and we need to kind of the full access and full support of, of these features. And so it's not uncommon for that to happen. Um, the, the way the scripts are targeted, they can be very simple and very targeted to a specific experiment and very only work on this type of data, exact this type of data. It's very common for people not to kind of write these general scripts that I've written that are a little bit more broadly uh, accessed, but really you write a script just for you. Nothing wrong with that. Um, if you want to post that to MRS Open, uh, I, I please encourage you to, if you've written stuff, post it. If it's simple and if it's just for your data, it doesn't mean someone cannot use that code to kind of work on something else. Uh, and add on to it and make their own particular script and work on to it. I, I encourage people to kind of look at those scripts and hopefully get people to kind of upload more of their data to Amaris Open. I am kind of the official tester of extensions that come in there uh, and make sure that they work as, as described. Um, but again, please, please, I encourage you to upload any uh, scripts that you have, even if they're not complete or they're not perfect uh, and they just did one particular tool. Um, like I said, they always have a potential to be more broad-based and you know, just because I wrote an ex extension for Kiss and Run, for example, maybe you can use it for something completely different that I haven't even thought of. Uh, you know, the, the type of research that's going out there uh, these days is, is very unique. Everyone's doing kind of their own thing. Everybody wants to, their own niche uh, for doing certain types of analyses. You know, and Mars XT has the potential to, to aid in that uh, type of research. And finally, um, this is something I've, I've been itching to do for, for a number of years. Uh, it's kind of uh, in the infancy state, so it's not really uh, quite existent. But what I'm planning on trying to do for, uh, as part of a, a support email blog or an email response, uh, a non-regular update of existing extension for people that are currently in maintenance. So, so the people that registered for this talk and the previous talk, uh, if you're under maintenance, you may get an email from me on a non-regular basis. It's not going to be a very common uh, occurrence, maybe once a month, once every other month. Whenever there's a new extension or something new on MRS Open that has been uploaded that I think is worth noting, I may send out an email uh, to a group of people that are kind of in maintenance customers uh, within the Bitplane community. Uh, if you don't want that email, then just yeah, just email us back and post to take you off. But it's, it's not going to be a very common occurrence. It's just something that I wanted to keep people apprised of what's new because I I'm usually the worst offender in looking at a Mars Open to see what's new. Uh, but now that I'm more involved with um, XT and testing of these extensions, I'm, I'm a, a regular uh, visitor of a Mars Open to see what's new. Um, so hopefully, uh, I'll at least encourage you to, to check it out on your own if I, if I don't get this started. Um, but I will try to do that. And not, and not only that, I'll up to you on my custom scripts 
as well. Um, if, if I am working on something or if I need some help on something, I may, I may put something out there for people. Again, you know, my custom scripts are, are something I do on my own time outside of my Bitplane role, uh, but I do enjoy it. Uh, I'm kind of uh, accessing my inner programmer, and I really do enjoy it, and I, I hope you have enjoyed this talk today. Uh, I'm going to end there. I'm a little over my time, so I appreciate uh, everyone that has inspired me to make them, make these extremes, and I wish everyone the best in their coding and using any of these extensions or any of the ones on open. Thank you. Thank you, Murphy, for the excellent presentation. You really painted a great picture of your extensions. You presented many applications. You got into details. We don't really have many questions because I think you covered really a lot of things, but let me let me read loudly some of the questions that we are getting. So uh, what licenses actually you need to use all of those cool extensions? Do you need MATLAB license to use those? And what other MRS licenses do you need? Um, for any of the extensions, you need to have an MRS XT module. Uh, the XT module can be purchased separately. You may have a separate module, or it's part of many of the larger packages in Amaris as well. Uh, I encourage you to ask um, your, your, your salesperson or your core director to see what modules you have and if it's something that you want, uh, please ask them for it. Uh, as for MATLAB, uh, any of the extensions that are listed on open that are .m files, um, you need a full version of the software installed on your computer, full version of MATLAB installed on your computer. There are several extensions that are on open that also require specific MATLAB toolboxes. Um, uh, if you do not have the toolbox, the extension will put up an error uh, in there. Uh, I think we've tried to encourage the people that upload to open to list any toolboxes that are necessary. Um, I test it on my own as well, so I, I tend to know uh, which ones needed as well. But um, if you need those toolboxes, you can purchase those toolboxes. The academic price for MATLAB is really, really inexpensive. It's not that expensive, although most universities have site licenses for MATLAB, and it's fairly easy to get if you needed to get your hands on it. So, and it, often the extensions run a little bit faster in the MATLAB as opposed to the compiled, and there's a little bit more memory management uh, with those full MATLAB versions. So I do encourage, uh, if you're going to use this on a, on a larger data set, that the MATLAB versions of these extensions are a little bit more efficient um, than any of the compiled ones, even the ones that are built into the software. Um, but the, it's just a little bit more efficient. So that's what you would need to kind of launch these extensions. OK, thank you very much. And there is a question from Agor, one of our XT developers. Uh, is, is there a version of MRX for Linux? So we can answer there is no Linux version of MRX. So unfortunately, that is easy. And then a question about the surface surface contact area, which I think can be interesting for many users as well. So uh, the, how deep is the measurement? Uh, sorry, for uh, how deep has the second surface penetrated into the base one, so that the area is counted as contact? More than half a voxel. What's the how how close can? Yeah, so it's the one voxel contact. deep penetration. It's, yeah, okay. It's one. It's it's one voxel. Let me I'll bring it up real quick here. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen. I don't. Or am I? I don't know if I am. Am I sharing my screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it is sampling. If you look in here, let me zoom in real quick. Um, essentially, we are making a one micron thick shell. One one voxel. One micron. One voxel thick shell around the red surface, around the reference surface. That is essentially the region of interest. So it's really, it really, if you get right down to it, we're making a one voxel thick region of interest around the entire surface object. That region of interest is then sampled with the mask of the green cell. And if there's a one inside that mask, it's, cool, it's, it's overlapping. So it's just one voxel away from the surface. OK, thank that you, can be modified by, That can be modified, by the way. If you didn't want one micron, you wanted two microns, you could, you could adjust the script to make it two micron, uh, two voxel six, or what have, whatever. Just, whatever oh, right, but the adjustments are to be made in the script itself, or in the user. In the script. In yeah, the, the adjustments are, you'd have to actually go in the MATLAB script and make the adjustments okay. yourself. Yeah. 
Do you have any uh, advices for users to start uh, modifying the script? The basic um, advice? Yes. I mean, I would look at some of the very simple scripts that are available uh, through the, the, that are built into the software. That's how I got my start. Uh, I looked at some of the simple scripts that were written, um, for example, that are you know, spots close to surface or something very simple that's inside the software already. You know, if you go into the software here, um, and see if I can open it up. Right, if you go into um, Bitcoin, if you go into here, right, and you click any of these ones, these are all the built-in options, and you have MATLAB, pick a couple of the simple ones that are doing something similar that you want. For example, spots close to surface is a very common extension. Uh, it's a nice place to start. You can look at the extension. They're very well commented by some of our Bitplane developers when they first wrote these. So it really helps me kind of figure out what exactly the extension is doing and how to kind of modify it from that point on. And again, I try to comment my extensions as well. You're more than happy to look at them. I try to comment exactly what I'm doing, why I'm doing it within the extension. Some people are better at it than others. You know, some people don't comment at all, depending on how, you know, adept they are at coding. But I like to comment. Uh, detail because I, I tend to forget what what lines do what, so I try to keep track of it. So looking at some of these extensions, coding it, walking through it, debugging it, stepping through the process within the extension will help you kind of learn the process. And that's pretty much what I did. I had a base set of MATLAB knowledge when I started doing this. Um, I have a much better grasp of what's going on, but I have pretty much am self-taught at my coding. Um, and it's probably not the most efficient coding. Uh, like I said, it's, it's self-taught, but uh, it gets the job done and I'm, I'm continually learning on how to do it. And I think that's, that's the best way to do it. If you have time and you want to spend time learning it and you're interested in it, uh, just take a look at the existing extensions and work from there. Um, at some point, we may have some sort of, you know, um, some, some training on people on how to do this. And like I said, I'm working on some, some cheat sheets. Uh, there's a couple other avenues to do coding that are out there. There's an Amaris ICE connector tool created by Aaron Ponte that's available out there. You can kind of search that on the internet. I don't have a, a web page for it right now, um, but you can off, often, a lot of users use that uh, to kind of ease the process of creating extensions. Um, I'm not currently using that, but it, it's, it's a nice tool to kind of look into it and to get started in, in MATLAB and extension coding. Okay, thank you, Matthew. I think we run over time a bit, so we, we will close for today. So thank you for a great presentation. I hope all the attendees found it really interesting and important for their work. And we will send to all of the attendees and the, for all registered people the link to this webinar and the previous webinar from the series. So if you are interested in looking at it again, you can you will be able to watch the recording. I wish to you all a good day or a good night. Thank you.